Faith matters. An interactive program brought to you by MTA International. Assalamu alaikum and welcome to Faith Matters, a program where you, our viewers, on MTA set the agenda. And today's program has a special feature. We will be actually looking at the concept of Khilafat in Islam, Caliphate as it's known in the Western world, and its true meaning, its essence and place in Islam, and its place in the world today. But before doing that, uh, a very uh, deep Jazakumullah and deep thanks to all of you for the emails, the faxes that you've been sending in. As a reminder for all of you, just in case you don't know, as yet the Faith Matters uh, email is once again is faithmatters at mta.tv. That's faithmatters, one word, at mta.tv. And the fax number is 44 for the UK, 208 687 8037. Just as a reminder also, we have had many viewers write in and ask, where can I catch your programs if they've already passed? Well, they're available on YouTube, MTA Online 1, put in Faith Matters, the subject that you wish to follow, and it's there online for you to watch. Another new introduction to the Faith Matters program, from future programs, we will be using it as an interactive program with you, our viewers. So when you send in your particular email or fax, include your telephone number, and our production team here will be in touch. So if you want to participate directly with our panel here, put your phone number on, and we'll bring you right into the program. And without further ado, it's my absolute pleasure to introduce my very distinguished panel, if I may, to my immediate right. Assalamu alaikum, Azhar Hanif Sahib. Wa alaikum as wa rahmatullah. Welcome to you once again, Azhar Hanif Sahib, as viewers will know, is the Naib Amir, Naib President, Vice President of the United States, Jamaat. Welcome, Azhar Sahib. To his right, again, a familiar face on Faith Matters is our is Maulana Abdul Ghani Jahangir Sahib, who is head of our French desk here in London. Jahangir Sahib, welcome once again. A pleasure you, seeing you. Assalamu alaikum. And to his right, again, a man who needs no introductions on Faith Matters. He's someone that I'm sure is quite familiar, Dr. Zaid Khan Sahib, who's chairman of the Kazar Board here in the UK. Assalamu alaikum, Dr. Saab. Wa alaikum as wa rahmatullah. Gentlemen, as I've said in my introduction, today's program is very specific. It's on the concept of Khilafat in Islam and its uh, place within Islam and its application in the modern world today. But before we sort of go into the questions, Dr. Saeed Saab, if I could come to you. Khilafat, what does it actually mean? What's its origins? What, where does it come from? Mm -hmm. Before I uh, answer that, perhaps I can just say that the month of May it holds special significance. In fact, 27th of May today holds special significance because this is the start of the institution of Khilafat in the Jamaat Ahmadiyya in 1908, following the demise of the Promised Messiah, salam. So Khilafat, uh, Khalifa, is a word that is derived from Khalafa, meaning uh, one who comes after. Okay. Uh, Imam Ibn Kathir has further explained this, and he has said that the Khalifa is a person who performs the duty uh, of another person who has gone before him. So uh, loosely translated into English could be a successor. And in Islamic terminology, we have two types of uh, Khalifa. One is uh, Khalifatullah, which refers to the prophets of God who are sent down um, with messages. And uh, Khalifatun Nabi, is the process of successorship after the passing of a prophet. The Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has uh, defined this and has made it clear that there has been no prophet who has been sent who has not been succeeded by a Khalifa. So this is the terminology. So it's a natural progression after each prophet. It's a natural progression and happens uh, without fail after each, each prophet has passed away. Zakumullah, I think that sets the context of the questions we have. And we'll go to the first question, which we have from uh, Said Saab from London. Zakumullah, for your question. And he writes, Assalamu alaikum. Um, he's uh, very kind in his comments about faith matters. I'm glad you're enjoying it. And please do carry on watching. And he's actually quoting a video he saw of a Pakistani religious scholar who said that in Islam, there is no concept of Khilafat. The term is not a religious term. It's only used by people for a Muslim head of state. Now, he himself actually says that he was not only surprised, he was quite shocked when he 
saw this video. And he feels that it's a uh, twisted interpretation, is the word he used, of concept of Khilafat and a denial. Jahangir Khan Saab, if I could come to you first of all on this. The, can you please explain the concept of uh, Khilafat according to Islamic teachings, perhaps with the, the primary focus, first of all, in the <coughs> Holy Quran? Yeah, so I'm quite surprised as well to hear that a, a religious Indeed, he's described as a religious scholar. leader would yeah. say that uh, this concept is, is a political one. It's uh, applied only to uh, the head of a state. That's a political context, therefore. That's absolutely erroneous because had he read the Holy Quran, again, it's, uh, it's a shameful thing to say that he's a religious leader, but it seems that he hasn't been reading the, the Holy Quran very carefully. He would have seen that the definition given of a Khalifa, the, 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 uh, the, the great works that the Khalifa has to carry out, carry through, uh, are all religious in nature. As we'll see from the verse, the Ayatul Istikhlaf, or the verse of uh, the Khilafah, uh, in Surah An Nur. And if you take Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim to be the first verse, then it would be verse number 56, otherwise it would be verse 55. And I'll just read that uh, for you now. A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitanir Rajeem, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Wa'ad Allahu Alladheena Amanu Minkum, Wa'amilu Salihati, La Yastakhlif Annahum Fil Ardi, Kama Stakhlaf Alladheena Min Qabalihim, Wa La Yumakkinanna Lahum Deenahum Alladhe Irtada Lahum, Wa La Yubaddilannahum Min Ba'di Khawfihim Amna, Ya'budunani La Yushrikuna Bi Shay'a, Wa Man Kafara Ba'da Thalika, Fa Ula'ika Humul Fasiqoon. And this means that Allah has promised to those among you who believe and who do good works that he will surely make them successors in the earth, meaning khulafa, he'll make them caliphs in the earth, as he made successors from among those who were before them. And why is that? And that he will surely establish for them their religion, which he has chosen for them, and that he will, he will surely give them in exchange security and peace after their fear. And what is that about? It's when the Prophet dies, when a Prophet passes away, the whole community of the Prophet is thrown into insecurity yes. and fear. What's going to happen to us? The great man, like for example, when, uh, when uh, Moses, peace be upon him, passed away, they say that the children of Israel mourned him for 40 days and 40 nights. They couldn't believe that he was, he was dead. Of course. Because by that time, after having spent 40 years in the desert with him, wandering around, they'd, they'd grown fond of him and grown very attached to him and suddenly they lost him. So this is what Allah is saying here. He says that he'll give you caliphs so that he will remove your, secu your insecurity and your fear and he will establish your religion for you. This is what he's saying. And also they will worship me, Allah is speaking, and they will not associate anything with me. Then whoso is ungrateful after that, they will be the rebellious. So everything that is mentioned here is religious. Indeed. The insecurity is, will, is a, 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 with respect to a, a religious figure passing away. And it's, it has to do with worshipping God, that they continue to worship God. There has to be some manifestation of God in some person so that they can continue. So all this is religious. So really this person, if he is a, a religious scholar, then I'm amazed. Mm -hmm. Because he hasn't, been, re he reflect hasn't, once more yes, he hasn't the, been reading the Quran very carefully. Um, and the word <coughs> successor, Azhar Hanif Saab, is used quite specifically there. Into the time of the Holy Prophet وسلم, obviously he himself was guided on this. I mean, the, the turmoil, there was a brief expression when the Holy Prophet himself passed away, um, even w amongst his followers at that time, but it was that particular verse and indeed the teachings and the sayings of the Holy Prophet which calmed the Muslim community. Indeed, we saw Khilafat al-Rashidin immediately mm -hmm. after his demise, mm -hmm. which was established therein. But Turning to the words of the Holy Prophet ﷺ, for our viewers, what did he actually say about this concept of Khilafat? Yes, well, uh, before coming to this and, and drawing on what has already been said by our mm -hmm. two distinguished scholars here, uh, I, I think what I would first like to share is I'm not so, conf uh, so confused and, and shocked by what this scholar has said. Because he's at that era in the history of Islam when this mm -hmm. is the general sense. This is the, the, the belief that has slowly crept into the minds of even the scholars of Islam. It's happened before. But they're fragmented, sorry to take it aside, because yeah. they, there's a crying will you hear across the world, oh, we need Khilafat, Khulafa needs to be established, the Islamic 
Kolapa needs to be established. Yes, it's true. So, so it's you've true. got this side of the it's argument true, being presented. But present. as I go back in history, just briefly, and I look at the Jewish community, after the death of Hazrat Musa, as was mentioned, he had a, 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 a successor, a Khalifa. It was Hazrat J uh, Joshua. Mm -hmm. uh, and this was the Khalifa who we had appointed in his lifetime that when I pass away, you will take over. And he was the one who caused them to enter the Holy Land. But now you ask any Jew in the world, who is your Khalifa? And it's a su su surprising concept to them. Khalifa? What is Khalifa? We have no Khalifa. We have rabbis, we have committees, we have groups, and that's it. You see? The same is true now in many churches or Christian groups. Hazrat Isa, Jesus Christ, alayhi salam, upon his, his, his point of about to separate from the Israelites, uh, who he was preaching to, he also instituted the idea of someone has to be in my place behind me. It was James the Righteous, according to our understanding, although they may believe it was Peter, the rock, but we believe one of these two was going to be his successor. But now in the Christian world, there's a complete divergence of views on who is actually the leader of the, of the church. And not everyone accepts the Pope for this purpose. There are the so there, yeah. there we see a very practical demonstration of why Khilafat is required, is required for unity of all, all the these communities. Things, all these things. But my point is, you ask the common Jew or Christian in the street now about Khilafat or the successor, and they'll have the same uh, variety of views as this gentleman has said and other Muslims who would have said in contrary to what his belief is. So it's not shocking. In fact, now when I come back to the Holy Prophet Muhammad, so so what he said about the Muslims, it confirms this is exactly what's going to happen. And one uh, tradition where, uh, again, most of us are well aware of, he indicated clearly that in the end of this slow degeneration of, of beliefs and the arising of those who would not be Khalifas but like monarchs and despotic rulers, then the Khilafat would once again appear in the world. So first he would be there, then there would be a Khilafat, then there will be this slow decline in the, in, in the system. They will turn into the rulers. And we, we've seen this history. I'm not going to go into the whole history of Islam. Of I think most Muslims know this. Mm -hmm. And when you look at that group, who were called Khalifas, the last being the Sultan uh, of, of uh, Turkey, you wouldn't want to call this person your religious leader because he was almost so secular in his approach. That created a sense that it's secular, it's political, it's not religious. So the Muslim from that time forward would begin to think that yes, the Khalifa was no more than a political leader, uh, almost a despotic ruler. Why should we invest in him spiritual qualities as was the indication of the Holy Prophet Muhammad so all about this. So the Holy Prophet was quite specific in, in saying what a Khalifa is and what his purpose is and how he would succeed him indeed well, in his own tenure as well that he defined that there, this would follow immediately after his passing. Exactly, exactly, exactly. So turning to some of the, the actual prophecies that we see, there's uh, one in particular about that this is the second manifestation. We would actually see Khalafat in its divine right. But in the context of the Holy Prophet, are there specific sort of hadith specific uh, traditions we can actually highlight? which actually demonstrate in the words of the Holy Prophet specifically. I can read out this one, uh, just take a, a couple of minutes or so. I'll, I'll just read the basic translation in English for the sake of time. Uh, basically, in uh, the book of Masnan Ahmad, uh, he has given us this tradition that prophethood, according to the statement of Holy Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, shall remain among you as long as Allah shall will. He will bring about its end and follow it with khilafat on the precepts of prophethood for as long as he shall will and then bring about its end. A tyrannical monarchy will then follow and will remain as long as Allah shall will and then come to an end. So already we have these three periods. There will follow thereafter monarchical despotism to last as long as Allah shall will and come to an end upon his decree. So this is an another era. There will then emerge Khilafat on the precept of prophethood. So after this long decline, and we link it to the actual the decline of Islamic community, not the faith, but so their, the ummah, uh, their, their actual diversion from this concept. Okay. And this this you know the development of the leadership, which is becoming more and more corrupt over the course of time. And it will lead to the emergence of Khilafat. And then he said, uh, he said no more, he became quiet. So, so we know that now this is the sense that once again Khilafat will emerge and this 
it would, would go on to reign amongst the Muslim world. And we are saying this Indeed. is what is the blessing of the Jamaat Ahmadiyya, mashallah. Dr. Zaid Saab, on this point, picking up mm. Azhar Saab's yeah. point, I think there's in that tradition, we see two very important points. Not only is the concept of Khilafat, the succession, mm. made clear, but the Holy Prophet was also, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, was also particular in stating that this would follow on the precept mm of prophethood in the context of the Amdiya Muslim community and in particular mm -hmm. uh, with the advent of Hazrat Masih Maud, the promised Messiah, who was the founder of the Amdiya Muslim community. What did he say about the concept of Khilafat, indeed after his uh, mission? Th there are several issues uh, related to this aspect and one, one thing for sure is that as Jahangir Sahib has quoted from the Holy Quran, it is a promise of Allah. It is not just a statement but it is a promise of Allah and Allah never goes against his promise that Khilafat will be established. Mawlana Azhar Hanif Sab has also from Hadith proved that the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was absolutely clear that the Khilafat that would come in the end would be everlasting and it would never end. But one of the criterion that was given uh, in the Hadith is that it would be on the precepts of prophethood. So this is okay. the difficulty that the Muslim Ummah have, that without a prophet having come to the world again, <coughs> that Khilafat obviously cannot exist. And no matter how hard they try, and try to knock everybody together, as you, have, as you mentioned mm -hmm. yourself, that there is all this hue and cry about let's have a Khilafat in the Islamic world. And they cannot obviously succeed in that because Khilafat is not man-made. Yes. Um, and secondly, be until and unless they believe in the coming of the Promised Messiah alayhi salam, as, um, as an Ummati Nabi and that criterion having been fulfilled which is mentioned in the Hadith then we can have Khilafat. So all these conditions are there and they have to be fulfilled accordingly before we see Khilafat and by the grace of Allah we see uh, as a practical example the only community in the Muslim world who fulfills all of these criteria and who have this Khilafat established in amongst ourselves for over a hundred years. The promised Messiah alayhi salam, in his writings, in the will, uh, in his book al Basiyat, he has made it absolutely clear that it has been the practice of Allah from time immemorial. And Hazrat Masih Ma'ud alayhi salam, is referring to the prophets of Allah that were sent and their successors that appeared, as Hanif Sahib has said, has told us about the Jews and the, and, and the uh, Christians who had uh, successors after their prophets passed away. And the Promised Messiah has said that when I pass away, that second manifestation, he has called it the second manifestation of Allah, because he is the prophet, is the first manifestation of Allah. And once the prophet passes away, then that second manifestation will come. And he referred it to as when Hazrat Abu Bakr Siddiq who was also uh, succeeded the Holy Prophet sallam, as a Khalifa, that he too would be succeeded after his demise. Gentlemen, Jazakallah, I think we'll move on to the next question, but uh, Sayyid Saab, I, I, I suggest that if, if this uh, Pakistani religious scholar is known to you, you direct him to uh, no better reference point than the Holy Quran, the Word of God, and um, if he needs that still further substantiation, the words of the Holy Prophet sallam, and maybe then he perhaps can reflect on his own definition of Khilafat. And the next question we have comes from uh, Mahmoud Ahmad Saab in the United States. And um, it's the, I just want to send a bit of the context of this particular question. Um, just for our viewers' benefit, after the demise of Hazrat Promised Messiah, the founder of the Amdiya Muslim community, there were some individuals who raised the question as to what succession meant and how would that be encapsulated? And there was a feeling that it, by them, certainly these few individuals, that it should be constituted in the form of an anjuman, a committee. However, based on this view, and notwithstanding the fact that these individuals actually did swear allegiance at the hand of the first caliph within uh, Amdiyat, Hazrat Malvi Nuruddin Sahib, they nevertheless still chose to establish themselves separately in Lahore. So I hope you, that just gives you a context of the question we have received from Mahmoud Ahmed Sahib. And he writes this, he uh, uh, wishes to extend a very warm assalamu alaikum to all pan the whole panel. 
and he actually also is enjoying the program. Jazakallah, Mehmoud for your question and your comments. But he reverts to a particular article he saw, um, which was actually published by the Amdiya Anjama Nishat e Islam, um, the, the group I've just of individuals I've referred to, which quotes the following passage from the Promised Messiah, Hazrat Mirza Ghulam Ahmed's book, The Will. And I will just quote a few lines from here where he says, and I quote, since it, since it is the way of God from times immemorial that God Almighty shows two manifestations so that two false joys of the opponents be put to an end. It is not possible now that God should relinquish his sunnah of old. So do not grieve over what I have said to you and nor your heart should be distressed. For it is essential for you to witness the second manifestation also and its coming is better for you because it is everlasting, the continuity of which will not end until the day of judgment. And that second manifestation cannot come unless I depart. But when I depart, God will send that second manifestation for you, which shall always stay with you as promised by God in Brahina Amdiya. This is actually a reference to the words of Hazrat Promised Messiah Mirza Ghulam Ahmed Sahib, <coughs> who then the article, the questioner rather, puts forward that the article then states that the promised Messiah never mentioned the word khilafat. Instead, he used the term second manifestation, which was to succeed after his demise. It then goes out to say that the uh, group of individuals who established themselves in Lahore, the Anjuman, uh, actually quote that this second manifestation actually doesn't mean khilafat, it actually means this Anjuman. Can you please explain what is meant by the second manifestation and why it means Khalafat and not Anjuman? Jahangir Saab, if I could come to you with, first of all, not least because it's someone from the USA and uh, perhaps I shouldn't always rely on Nazar Saab to answer questions from the USA. Jahangir Saab. Actually, I think we should get this um, <clears throat> false concept out of the way very quickly. And it's easy to do so because it's very clear. The Anjuman or the committee, the administrative committee, is something which was created by the Promised Messiah himself, salam, during his lifetime. In this quote here, he is clearly saying that the second manifestation cannot come until I have departed. He said, when I go, then Allah will send it. So it's not the Anjuman then. And that's the end of the Anjuman as far as that's concerned. It's not the second manifestation. So the, manif the second manifestation has to be something else. Luckily for us, in the same book, just a few lines before the, the quotation you presented here, the Promised Messiah is speaking exactly of this. He says that when the Prophet dies, what happens? The enemies of the Prophet are, are happy on two counts. One, their arch enemy is gone. So he's no more. The Prophet sent by God, whom they hate. And two, now his mission is going to come to an end. Because when he's not here, who's going to carry, you know, carry on his good works? or his, according to them, his bad works. But then Allah sends uh, the second manifestation to, to uh, remove those, or to kill both of their, their joys, if you want. Uh, uh, you know, the, the things that they were saying before, that they were happy about. So God kills that in one go. By, what did he say then, the Prophet said? He said, by sending Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu anhu. This is what he did for the Holy Prophet Muhammad sallallahu When the Holy Prophet Muhammad Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa died, when he passed away, his enemies were jubilant. Now the Prophet is gone and now his mission and the religion of Islam will disappear. But then he says Abu Bakr Siddiq was raised up and he, he, that was the second manifestation. And now we know Abu Bakr Siddiq was a Khalifa. What came after An-Nubuwa? It's Al-Khilafa. According to the, the hadith which uh, uh, as Al Hanif Sahib uh, just presented a, a few minutes ago, this is what the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said. He said it's called Al Khilafatu Ala Min Hajin Nubuwa. It's, it's the Khilafat styled according to, based on, or styled according to prophethood. It's the one which comes after prophethood and which follows in its footsteps, which carries on the same good works as are done by the one who has the Nubuwa, who is the Nabi himself, who is the Prophet. So, therefore, the second manifestation is Khilafat. That it can be nothing else. But one thing is certain, it cannot be the committee or the Anjuman because it was there before the Promised Messiah departed. Yeah. Azhar Saab, on a very practical basis, mm -hmm. in just briefly picking up on this point, you know, just putting even religion to one side, mm -hmm. decisions 
made by committees normally are never decisions because there's no clarity mm -hmm. over who the leader is. So whether mm -hmm. it's in the context of professional life, in business life, the more successful organizations we often see are those who are clear in mm -hmm. a single leader directing them. That's right. So That's from right. a practical point of view as well, the interpretation that um, yes. these individuals make is somewhat exactly. uh, without uh, foundation. A, a government in the world, not a single one, can be ruled by committee because all of that uh, internal conflict that, that's generated from the discussion alone. Uh, we have, the, we have the, the, you know, the classic joke that if you want to kill a program, just put it in committee. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so exactly what they're saying about Khilafat. You want to kill Khilafat, put it yeah. in committee. Yeah. Because in the early era of Islam, when Khilafat was under attack by those uh, uh, insurgent in, uh, elements amongst the Muslims at that time, and this is a whole another issue, but I'm not going to go into details of which, but it is well known that there was a group in the time of the f first uh, era of Khilafat who were attempting to overthrow the institution. When they succeeded in actually attempting to assassinate, jump into the, the home of the Caliph Hazrat Uthman, the third Khalifa, after the Holy Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, may Allah be pleased with him, he gave them a stern warning as they entered his courtyard, drawing daggers about to take his life. He said, if you succeed in this attempt on my life, you will never be united. You will never be able to pray together, and you will never be able to face your common enemy. And we have seen since that time the, the, the effect of his words are apparent to everyone right this day. The disunity is there because they no longer have that one leader. The lack of, 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 of uniformity in the way they pray or to pray behind one imam. Right now you go to Mecca and you'll see that there's groups praying in the holy house of Allah because they don't want to pray behind the other imam or the other sect. So the unity there is gone and the common enemy how long have we seen the issue of uh, the Islamic world attempting to create these committees, the, the IOC, who are going to take up the issue of Palestine and, and completely failing in this because of the, the issue of Khilafat? So we know on a practical term, this never works by having a committee, a group, to judge and to uh, administer the affairs of the Muslims. It has to be one person. And I think that's uh, quite clear. Uh, Mahmoud Saab, when he uh, uh, put his question forward, I, you know, if you see the, the concept of the Amdiya Muslim community on a worldwide basis, the use of the word Amdiya Muslim community, it's wherever you are in the world, it's the Amdiya Muslim community, which is the community here, which is one which is heard about, which is seen about, and it's demonstrable by its uh, success that it's had under the leadership of a Khalifa. Yeah, the, the institution of Khilafat, I mean, reflects the unity of Allah. And this is the, obviously the basic principle of Islam. And uh, by the grace of Allah, as you have said, 102 years of Khilafat, uh, one Khalifa, and for all the Ahmadis throughout the whole entire world, uh, one leader, and uh, everything that he decides we go by. So this is the beauty and the blessings that we are reaping today uh, of Khilafat that we have had amongst us. I, on a small lighter note, I, I was reminded by the blessings of Muslim television and the air as well that you know the opponents were actually looking at uh, after the uh, election of um, Khalifa Masih Khamis Ayyadullah Ta'ala bin Sir Aziz um, as the fifth successor and they were at the same time seeing Hazrat uh, Mirza Tahir Ahmed who was the fourth successor uh, Khalifa Masih Rabi addressing some questions on MTA and they said we were having difficulty dealing with one now we have <laughs> you know to, we'll never win now so it's just as a lighter note again on the blessings of the channel which we're part of but I hope Mahmoud Ahmed Saab um, again I, I would say to those friends who have chosen to um, align themselves with the people who set up the group in Lahore it's, it's very clear you need to go no further than the Holy Quran which defines quite clearly what the concept of succession is. And as our friends within the Lahore group would also agree that, frankly speaking, there is no uh, dispute over it. What the Holy Quran says is what should be taken as read. And even in the will, as Jangir Saab so eloquently put it, look at it in its full context. Don't just take out select phrases. You need to look at the will in its full context. But I'm sure from the answers given here by my guests, um, the answers also given 
for those who raised this question. Um, if we can move on to our next question that we've had, we, we seem to be globe trotting here. So um, we started, we're going now from the US to uh, Australia, to Melbourne, and uh, Vakar Khan Sahib, Jazakallah for your question. And Vakar Sahib writes the following. I recently had a discussion with a non the friend of mine about Khilafat. He has put a few questions to me, which are as follows. The first question is this, and we'll take each one in turn, if I may. The first one is, you say, in quotes, your Khalifa is appointed by God, but in reality, he's actually elected by human beings. Isn't this contradictory? Now, this is sort of taking the issue of how the Khilafat comes about, how it's appointed. Jhangir Khan Sahib, I could come to you with this, first of all. Obviously, anything which is uh, being done by people of God is being done under the influence of God, under the divine influence. But we must also remember that God manifests His will through people as well. Sometimes it, it, it's apparently a person who's doing something, but in actual fact it's Allah who's doing it. We have two uh, very well-known verses of the Holy Quran where this has been highlighted by God Himself. When we know in one of the battles, the Holy Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam picked up a handful of uh, sand and pebbles and threw it at the enemy, and a storm was whipped up by his doing so. This was just a signal to show that God is with him and the storm started there and then, and they were defeated. So Allah mentioning this incident in the Quran says, وَمَا رَمَيْتَ إِذْ رَمَيْتَ وَلَكِنَّ اللَّهَ رَمَى It was not you who threw, it was Allah who threw. Whereas we know that it was the Holy Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu who in effect threw the pebbles and the sand. But Allah said it was him, he himself who had done it. So that means that God's intention was manifested through the person. That was God's will. Again, we have in the incident where the Holy Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu was accepting the Pledge of Allegiance or al bayah from uh, s some of his followers. He put his hand above their hands and Allah mentioned this in the Quran and says, Yadullahi fawqa aydihim. It was God's hand which was above their hands. Whereas it was the, the Prophet's hand, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. <clears throat> so it means that when the Prophet was doing it, it was actual, in actual fact God who was, uh, who, who was behind it. So again, for the election of the, of the Khalifa, it is God who is, a, who is choosing the Khalifa. He's already chosen. But he inspires the believers to actually go for the right choice. And uh, there, are, there are many instances where we, we see God's hand actually behind it. And uh, I can tell you because uh, as uh, my origin is from Mauritius on my father's side, I can tell you, relate a little incident here, which was told to me by the person himself, the national emir, or the president if you wish, of the uh, Ahmadiyya community in Mauritius. He said when he was uh, 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 boarding the plane to come to the United Kingdom when the fourth Khalifa rahimahullah, had passed away for the election, as he is emir, he would be in, in the electoral college, um, he said that he was thinking, who am I going to, to vote for? I don't know, you know the people who are most able, etc. I might know, not know them personally at all. So how will I know? So he was praying to God saying, oh Allah, please guide me. Now he kept on praying and at one point he fell asleep or he dozed off for a little while and he saw a name in his mind. He didn't uh, write it down, but then he dozed off and saw it again. So this time when he woke up, he wrote it down on a piece of paper, sealed it in an envelope, and nobody knew what, what had happened. He gave it to one of his uh, colleagues who was with him in the, the airport. And he said, could you please keep this for me? I'll need it later. So okay. the person said, so all right. Not knowing right. what was in it, he took it and put it in his pocket. Okay. So then he proceeded to, to, to England, went for the, ele for the election. The election took place. And when the Khalifa, Hazrat Mirza Masroor Ahmad, was, uh, was uh, elected as Khalifa, he emerged from the mosque. And his colleague was standing outside waiting to congratulate him on the, the, the new election. He said, could you please pass me the envelope now? He said, yes. So he took it out of his pocket, said, could you open it and read me and tell me what's on that paper, please? So he, he, he opened the envelope, read the piece of paper, and what was written on it? Masrur, the name of the caliph to be. And he said, I did not know this person. I had not even heard the name. Yet Allah guided me. Now this is showing that Allah's hand was behind the whole process. And this is how Mirza Masur Ahmad was elected. And now he's the fifth Khalifa. May Allah uh, help him with his uh, support and strengthen his hand.
Inshallah. I, th I think one of the things, just for our viewers, again, as a reminder, um, please do send us in your comments and questions. But if you have any comments on what you're hearing today and indeed future questions, just as a reminder of the email again, it's faithmatters at mta.tv. That's faithmatters, one word, at mta.tv. And the fax number reminder again, it's 44 for the UK, 208 687 8037. Azhar Hanif Sahib, just on this point, if I may briefly, the whole concept of being guided by God, you know, whether it's um, the basis of the question, it's obviously a friend who has posed this to him, is what everything a Muslim does. It is our belief that we will be guided if you, you know, even today's program, before we started, before the cameras rolled, we began with a prayer, so we are guided rightly. Right. It seems, right. you know, so why should anything, in particular this concept be any different in Islam? It should, it should not confuse one who is a believer, but one who has doubts about faith, about belief, about trusting in God. Of course, this issue will always come up, that why are you making these decisions? Are they based on your own mind, your own intelligence, your own experiences, or is the Ruh al-Qudus, the Holy Spirit, Allah's uh, special help moving you in, in a path? And, and it may even go further into the issue of, of, of taqdiri Allahi, that the, the d divine decree and determination that is in our lives, how he has his own plan and, and moves us as a creation in a direction. Although we have some free will, but Allah also has a definite plan on how he wants things to move. So that is manifesting itself in every aspect of Allah's creation. He says there's not even a single leaf that will fall unless it's by his command. So how is it that on such a high level that it's involving the, the uh, faith and fate of all humanity. He leaves it to just the votes of, of human beings. He cannot. And in this sense, uh, there's a very clear hadith that speaks directly to this, that the believers, and going back to what Jahangir has mentioned from Quran, the beginning of those verses of Quran are the key to the, the whole issue of Khilafat. It says, وَعَدَ ladina amanu minkum." God didn't just promise to every single Tom, Dick, and Harry on earth to use a very English expression in talking about Islam. <laughs> Indeed, He's yeah. speaking to the believers. Mm. Aminu, those who have belief, salihati, and follow that up by being those who actually live their belief, who do the righteous deeds. He has promised them istikhlaf, that I will establish for you the, the khilafat. So if we are not true believers and not walking in the path of faith, of course, we probably will decline into the issue of politics, into the issue of personal personalities and egos, and that did happen in Islam, is the first tradition I, I, I read out, justified. When the Muslims lost, lost the path of faith, their decisions were now colored by the world, not by the spirit. And they began to make poor judgments, and the leadership reflected that. And the leadership then became despotic and became monarchical and all these things, and it destroyed it. But he said the prophet will be raised, the spirit, the faith is raised, decisions will be good. So here in the early era, the, mentioned in uh, Sahih Bukhari, Kitab al-Ahkam and Bab al-Istikhaf. The Holy Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa reported by Hazrat Aisha, he, he said <coughs> that he had intended to call in Hazrat Abu Bakr and hand him a writing for his khilafat meaning he was intending to, to make a decision right then, that I'll, I wish to appoint him in my lifetime to be my Khalifa. As I said in the case of Hazrat Musa, he did this for Hazrat Joshua. He, in his lifetime, said, you will be my Khalifa. The Holy Prophet then stopped. The Hadith goes on and said, so that after the death of the Holy Prophet وسلم, other claimants to the office might not arise, to, to make sure this is clear. But then the Holy Prophet وسلم, did not pursue the idea, believing, his belief now, that God would not accept the election of any other person besides Hazrat Abu Bakr as Khalifa, nor would the believers agree otherwise. So he's put in both contexts that neither would God let this happen, nor would the believers of that era choose otherwise. This is the whole issue of, of faith. I think that's very clear. And Vakar Saab, there's a series of questions his um, friend has posed who's uh, Muslim, but not from the Amdiya community. Next question, um, and Dr. Zayed Khan Saab, um, if I can come to you with this. He then goes on to ask, it's a simple question, but 
more on the mechanics, the process. How does the election of uh, Khalifa take place in the Amdiya Muslim community? So perhaps on the practical, yeah. what, what are the steps? Who's eligible to vote? And well, we, we've just been through the British election recently, and these two could be so wide apart, and there's so many differences, because we don't have any candidates, and we don't have any canvassing before the election obviously takes place. But what we do have administratively is uh, an electoral college which was um, initiated, set up by the second Khalifa, Hazrat Muslim Maud Anhu. And there are a number of stipulations on that as to who is a member of that electoral college. Uh, we, we, we have obviously at that time the surviving sons of the Promised Messiah were members of the electoral college. And above and ab uh, in addition to that, we have the national emirs of the Jamaats throughout the world. Um, we have the Sadran of the auxiliary organizations, and we have um, the heads of other auxiliary, uh, heads of other administrative bodies uh, in, in Rabwa and elsewhere. So these are stipulated members um, f uh, in, in that respect who form part of the Electoral College. And what happens is the Electoral College remains dormant, I suppose, if you can call it that, during the lifetime of the Khalifa or they work under him. But as soon as the Khalifa passes away, then that is an entirely um, independent body which comes into action, which convenes, uh, and uh, the election takes place. It should be noted that the elections, as I have previously mentioned, there is no canvassing. But what is strongly, strongly, strongly has occurred in all the elections is the reliance on prayers. And the members of the Electoral College obviously are muttaki, are righteous people who are appointed as such. And the only thing that they do is turn to Allah for guidance in, in that respect. So the election takes place uh, in the open in that Electoral College uh, body. And uh, it is a, by a show of hands. It is not by a secret ballot. Um, so that it is by erasing, re uh, proposing, seconding, and the raising of, of hands. And um, many of us were fortunate enough on April the 22nd, 2003, um, to witness this from the outside. We were in the streets that spilled out into Gresson Hall Road uh, at that time, deep into the night. And if you were, uh, words cannot describe the atmosphere and it was such a silent atmosphere prevailed over the entire area. And you could, you could sort of sense the uh, feeling uh, that everybody had. There was no idle talk at all. Um, and everybody was prayerful, uh, thoughtful, and at hope, uh, turning to Allah, uh, obviously, that uh, the, the Jamaat would be guided at, as it had been previously. Um, so that is the electoral college. Um, that takes uh, form and come together to elect the Khalifa of the time. And Dr. Zaisab, just to be absolutely mm. clear for our viewers' benefit as well, as you said, there's no canvassing, there's no preferred candidate. Indeed, there is no declared candidate sure. before the election actually takes place. It's all done within the confines of the Electoral College. And as you said, it's done in a very open way, again, differentiating itself from what commonly people perceive as elections, which is a secret ballot here. Everyone has to declare, uh, and people aren't allowed to abstain. They have to That's participate. Correct. Yes, everybody must use their vote. That, that is correct. There is, there is no ab abstention. Um, and just uh, as an afterthought, Jahangir Sahib obviously told us about uh, the Amir of Mauritian, Mauritius who had this. And I was reading uh, people from parts of Africa, from Pakistan, from Germany, from India, many, many, many hundreds of people had been given this glad tiding as far back as in the 90s that uh, this person would be elected the Khalifa. And they did not know who Hazrat Mirza Masroor Ahmad was at the time or what he looked like. And it was only after that he had been elected and in remote parts of Africa when, when his pictures were put in the mosques there, people would come in and say, this is the person that came in my dream years ago mm -hmm. as he was the head of the community. And they didn't mention it either, otherwise that would be a form of a preview. And, yeah, and, yes. and pre of no. It was only after the event yes. and them realizing that this, this was the same person. Mm -hmm.
So just as an aside, you mentioned the silence that mm -hmm. prevailed at that mm -hmm. time. I mean, I, I recount that occasion. We were all fortunate enough to be present. It was an electric silence, mm. that there was a sense of anticipation, of excitement, mm. of emotion as well. Mm -hmm. But what <coughs> struck me about that whole sense at that time, again, the beauty of Khilafat and the unity it brings, that even though the Jamaat in itself did not, for that brief moment of a few days, have a Khalifa, everything fell into place beautifully. Everything was organized seamlessly. Everyone knew, silently went about doing what they're doing, you know, and it was incredible you know, to witness that. And it was also seeing the sense that uh, I remember talking to our own Amir Saab of the UK, and I said to him, Amir Saab, you know, that it's amazing. All this is done without the need for organizational charts, sure. duty badges or anything. Everyone knew what they had to do. And this was, again, the blessing of c the continuation of Khilafah and Jangir Saab. I mean, you uh, will remember the whole very surreal scene almost. It was very, <coughs> very surreal. <coughs> Sorry. Very surreal indeed. And uh, I think the, the silence was one of a silent agitation as well. There was a great feeling of insecurity at that moment. And the only wish every Ahmadi had was, please Allah give us a Khalifa. We needed a Khalifa, whoever he was, we needed one. And we needed to, to have that guidance, we needed to have that comfort. That was, that was essential at that time. And uh, the, the, the whole Jamaat was waiting to receive orders from the Khalifa as well. And the eagerness could be shown in the very first order which the Khalifa gave. And it wasn't an order directed at the whole Jamaat. It was an order directed only at the people inside the mosque. But remember, as Dr. Zaid Khan Sahib had said, all the streets around the mosque as well were mm. absolutely jam-packed with people. It was just people all over. There weren't any cars. It was just people for, for you know, tens of meters around, mm. all, the, all the way around the mosque. And uh, we were being conveyed what was happening inside the mosque through, through the, the PA system. So we could hear through loudspeakers what was going on. At one point, when, when Hazrat Mizar Masrur Ahmad became the Khalifa, he then told the people to sit down. He said, sit down. Everybody inside the mosque and everywhere on the street, everyone just sat down on the road. There, and there was no question, nobody waited a second. Everybody was sit seated. And later on, the Khalifa himself was amazed at that. And he said, I had only meant it for the people in the mosque. But look at the level of obedience an eagerness to obey in the, in the Ahmadiyya community, alhamdulillah, that even the people outside sat down, you know? I can, add, I can add here, not only the people outside, and I was amongst them, mashallah, and we witnessed <laughs> this wave of energy coming toward us, of folks sitting down like a wave, and if you didn't sit down, you yeah. would have been crushed down, you know? <laughs> you know? One way even other, your good self. One no, way or no, other, no. you were going down, but all of it was obedience. Mm -hmm. One friend of mine in the USA, who was watching this scene mm -hmm. via MTA in a mosque, in the U.S., in the masjid, they were all sitting there waiting for this result, as he said, with anticipation, eagerness, and agitation. But the moment they also heard this, this first command to sit down, everyone, he said, in that mosque also sat down. <laughs> You're talking, you know, thousands of, of kilometers away from the point where he makes the statement. Even then, the believers being connected, they follow the command. This is unity. Yeah. This, is, this is the unity. I, I, I think, again, for an earlier question, I think the question is you know, try issuing that kind of uh, instruction by committee. Um, but nevertheless, I think it's quite clear about the blessings and the unity behind Khilafat. If we can go to our next question, um, gentlemen, it, this relates to, um, it has a historic perspective, but he writes that each of the Khulafai Rashidin was also head of the Islamic State and commander in chief, as he writes, of the Islamic army. Will the Amdi Khulafa also become political leaders and chiefs of the army once you gain power. The way it's been phrased is an interesting way. Jangir Khan Sahib. Well, as, again, as uh, Azhar Hanif Sahib had uh, rightly pointed out, these days uh, people do not understand the meaning of the term Khalifa. They have forgotten what the Quran itself says, what Allah says in the Quran, that it's a religious function. It's not a political one. So this question again is framed in the political sense that the Khalifa has to be the head of state. It's correct to say that the first Khulafa of Islam so happened to be heads of state as well, but that was a, it was by coincidence. It so happened that the new state emerging, there was a state emerging at the same time as Islam was emerging. The head of, uh, of Islam was the Khalifa, so he had to as assume 
this uh, this uh, how do I say this role, yeah. a, a double role if you wish, but the two were by no means linked, and <coughs> sorry, had the function of the of Khilafat been linked to politics, then it would certainly have been linked to the prophethood first before him, because the khil Khalifa follows the prophet, and uh, has to do what the uh, to, to take up you know the, the work where the prophet left it. This is how it functions. Now we see that the Holy Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu was a prophet for many years before he took on any political role at all. But he was still a prophet. So that means that a, a person can be a prophet without having a political role. In the Holy Quran there were so many prophets mentioned that had no uh, power at all. For example, the, the Messiah, son of Mary, Jesus Islam, he had no political role, he had no power, yet he was a prophet. The same for, for John. He had no political power. The same for, for, for Zechariah. There are so many who had no political power at all. So these two are not synonymous. They're coincidental. It can happen, but it's not a must. Therefore, to say that when the Ahmadis get power, will the Khalifa be the head of state? The question which, uh, which uh, begs to be asked is, um, of which state? Will there be just one state in the whole world? Or will the Khalifa be the head of any particular state? The Khalifa is for the whole of the world. He's the religious leader for all Muslims all over the world. And uh, he cannot be the head of state of, of, of the whole world. Nobody can actually be the head of the whole world. So it's, a, it's, it's an impossibility. So therefore, when that question was asked to Hazrat Khalifa Rabi, rahimahullah, he said that the Khalifa will be a separate figure. And he said there will be heads of state who will be perhaps Ahmadi, if they are. They will seek guidance from him, but they will, he will not be their political leader. So it's quite distinct, <coughs> Dr. Zaid Saab, that you know, the political sort of context of Khilafat, which some people perceive it to be, and the Amdiya interpretation basis of what we define Khilafat to be is very distinct. It's, a, it's something of guidance. It's uh, created through the, the hand of Allah, and it's something which is there for moral, spiritual guidance. Um, and not for some kind of political dominance. Absolutely. I mean, it's a spiritual organization, after all, and the Khalifa is the spiritual head of the, of the movement. And we do not um, have this impression that we are wanting to gain power because we want to win the hearts of people um, and we do not wish for anything else. And we want to remind them of our role and our responsibility to our Creator and to our fellow man. So this is what our Khalifa is constantly extolling us to do. And this is a very much a spiritual um, tradition, a spiritual sense. And this is what we want to do, is to win hearts rather than win armies in that respect. Jazakallah, gentlemen. Last sort of five minutes or so of the program. Um, and time seems to have flown by very quickly. Final question we have is on the status of who can become a Khalifa in terms of gender. Differentiation, and the question is a simple one, which is, can a woman become a Khalifa? If not, what is the logic behind not having a woman as a Khalifa? Azhar Saab, if I could come to you to begin with on that. Well, to take the question, which uh, in the minds of some of our listeners probably would need more answer, at last, uh, uh, maybe this is not the, uh, the desire to, to do justice to it, but very briefly speaking, uh, is Islam, as all other religions, has defined the human nature very clearly and has given us rights and roles within our natures, men and women. And I say in religion in general because if you look at the issue from all the religions prior to Islam, they had a very similar concept of what are roles for men, what are roles for women, defined through the religious uh, teaching. And that's based on the nature of man. And, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking about the fitrat al-nas, the nature of man is the real religion. You can't go away from it. So if men want to have babies, they, as much as you desire, you cannot do it. If women want to go out and, and, and fight and, and be the, the strength of an army, of, of a community, she doesn't, she's not really built for this kind of capacity. So in short, the short answer is, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has not given her a duty which she knew by her nature would be very difficult for her to bear. One, many of the Khalifas themselves have said, if you knew what this burden of Khilafat was, you would never desire it. Indeed. And secondly, 
of the best era of Islam, you talk about the earliest era during the time of Holy Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, if there were to be a woman considered, you would think it would be one of the, of the women of that era, especially of his wives. But they never even considered to put them into that role. Hazrat Aisha Anha, as we know, was considered to be such a scholar, such a, a luminary in Islam, that he, the Prophet, told that you can learn half the faith from her. Yet she was not considered over her father to be the first Khalifa. It could have been done because the Muslims realized this really is not the best role for women to assume. To lead men in prayer, to lead them in, 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 in government, to lead them in, on, as, as a chief of an army, to be constantly in, engaged with men who are not in the prohibitive degrees of, of relationships on, on a regular basis. No man wants to put women into that kind of struggle and strain and stress. And it's very stressful, it's very difficult. So Allah has not asked us to choose them for this very onerous and, and difficult task and allow them to focus their energy and their natural talents toward different things. The equality issue, therefore, is not challenged because we are equally given duties in the world, but they're just separate duties, and that, that's all we're saying here. So, so there's a real definition behind what a, and I think this is sometimes uh, the erroneous interpretation some people take, that it degrades the status of women mm -hmm. within Islam, but it's far from it because there are defined responsibilities. Defined and indeed, Islam, yeah. as you stated of the status of the Holy Prophet's wives, oh, okay. They've made very great intellectual contributions mm -hmm. um, to Islam and certainly after the demise of the Holy Prophet وسلم, you know, as well, Hazrat Aisha yeah. played a very constructive and key part mm -hmm. in ensuring the future of Islam and its uh, application throughout the world as well. Yes, yes. And this doesn't, and just as a final point, it doesn't sort of preclude, you know, a question we may arise is, well, why do you have leaders who are women? Why do you have professionals who are women, you know, you have very able doctors, you have very able lawyers. Just a small point on that. It's, it's, a, it's a different sphere, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, the, the uh, requirements of those particular duties are not anywhere near the requirements of being a Khalifa. It's, it's almost as equal to the requirement of being the Prophet himself. You're representing the Prophet of God. So it goes back to the very issue of, in all this history of humankind, women have received revelations. Women have reached very high spiritual heights, but Allah has never requested or, uh, or conferred upon them the duty of being a prophet, nor therefore the successor of the prophet. This is something which has always been given to the, to the realm of men because of their spirit, their nature, and their capacities to handle this very onerous office. Well, gentlemen, I think we've had a very detailed uh, discussion, and Jazakumullah for your scholarly answers to the questions which were raised. And to our viewers, I also say, if there are questions you have, comments you have, please do remember, you know, I hope by now what the email is, it's faithmatters at mta.tv, that's faithmatters, one word, at mta.tv, and the fax number is 44 for the UK, 208 687 8037. And just as a reminder in future programs, if you want to be part of this program, make it more interactive. As you put in your question, let us have your telephone number and our production team will be in contact so you can pose your question directly to our distinguished panel. And talking of our panel, gentlemen, Jazakumullah on behalf of Faith Matters for your contributions today. Inshallah, I'm sure we'll see you all again. But for now, Jazakumullah and to you, our viewers, faith does matter. We hope from our discussions here, we show that. And if faith matters to you, remember to write in. Until the next time, from all of us here in the London studios on Faith Matters, Assalamu Alaikum.